Um, thanks very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Um, we're all very excited about this webinar. Um, just the amount of people that have signed up for it, we're just amazed. So yeah, meanwhile, yes, we're also going to um, launch a wonderful research report, which is being prepared by Jude Sherry and Dr. Frank O'Connor. Um, just as a quick overview, overview, I just want to talk about the CTCHC programme. So we set it up in 2016 and late 2016, initially with no funding. Um, but it was just due to demand. Basically, people will come into the Heritage Council and say, you know, can you help us? So there's currently 15 towns in the programme, 70 partners. We also have 45 towns on a waiting list, waiting to join phase one. Um, phase one is basically about creating baselines, the CTCHC baseline. So what we do is we focus on recording, surveying, mapping, um, geospatial data. Um, for historic town centres. So it's really, it's quite new and next year we're moving on to a digital platform. So yeah, it's really exciting. Um, four phases for the programme are envisaged and um, phase two is about looking at town centre and building renewal plans. So we have two towns that are just about to move into that phase. So that's Dundalk and Sligo. Also, um, we've just set up recently actually the Irish Towns Diaspora Network and we had our very first meeting last Friday. So that was really good. Just amazing people all over the world who are, who are Irish and really want to help with town centre regeneration. And the reason that we set that up was because of the podcast that we released late last year and the analytics came back that everybody was listening around the world. I suppose with um, lockdown, people re really did reconnect with their place. Um, so that was very, you know, inspiring in terms of the meeting that we had last Friday. Just such good people. Um, and then really just to say, town centres first, the policy, we really need a policy for town centres. The CTCHC programme has been advocating for town centre first policy since 2019. So yeah, it's much needed. Okay, so we have a number of fabulous speakers today um, who I want to introduce. So we've got Rob Cass, who's a real estate developer with over 20 years experience in the sector. We have Dermot Lawler, who is one of the directors of um, Scottish Futures Trust. And actually Dermot was at the first meeting of the Diaspora Network. So I mean, Dermot's great. He's originally from Wexford. Um, we have Jude Sherry and we have Dr. Frank O'Connor, who are both directors of Enish Agency. And they're also the authors of the report that we're going to launch today. So yeah, it's really good. Lots of work, um, you know, last few months, crazy time. People think the summer is sort of, you know, freezing off, but I don't think so. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Chris Chapman, who is going to be our facilitator today and is going to tell us a wee bit about the format of um, the event. Okay, Chris, over to you. Brilliant, thank you. So uh, yeah, let's just, good, I'm on the screens. Um, no, wonderful to be with you all today. And uh, yeah, we're at uh, 115 or, or so, uh, which is just completely brilliant. Um, so it's a pretty simple, straightforward format. Uh, as Ali said, we're going to have kind of three presentation pieces. And then between those, we'll have little bits of conversation and discussion. Um, we will use technology a little bit to uh, get you know get some feedback and ideas from people in the call although obviously because it's a pretty big call uh we're pretty constrained in terms of kind of you know we can't all have one big discussion in a efficient kind of way um i think if to kind of make the sequence really simple uh what we're going to do is we're going to think about a little bit about why do we have these problems in ireland you know what what is it about the way we do things the way we are the, the way things work here um that that means we have these difficulties so in you know what and the consequences of that uh and yeah you know, rob cass will be talking to that particularly in the first presentation uh and then we're going to hear a bit um from the experience in scotland uh, and we'll move on to okay. So, well, what can we do about it? What you know, what 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 can be done about it? And hopefully, by the the end of the afternoon, as we move towards four o'clock, we'll actually also have a sense of well, what can we, the people in this room, actually do about it? You know, what's what's our role in this, and, and you know, how can we contribute? So, it's not just one of those webinars where someone's telling you uh, they've got it all sorted, but it's very much um, an occasion where we you know we're we're trying in a sense to you know, build the network, build the movement. Uh, build, you know, start to connect up the group of people who are actually going to make things happen. So um, I will move swiftly into our first presentation. So our first presenter is Rob Cass. Um, Rob is a very experienced developer internationally and also in Ireland. 
which means he's really well placed to tell us some stories and perspective us some perspectives uh, on why things don't work better here, um, which is uh, you know a, a good place to start. Um, I was reading up some of the, the things that Rob has said about himself on various websites, and uh, he describes himself as somebody who likes to challenge the status quo. So that seems a pretty good place to start. So. Uh, Rob, if I can uh, hand over to you and spotlight you for everybody, and then you can share the screen. That's great. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, can everybody see the screen, I guess? Just checking. It's coming up as a blank screen at the moment, Rob. So it says Rob Cast okay. started screen sharing, but you've, you're showing us a blank screen. Right. Uh, there, now we're, that's it, we're away. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ali, for this very inspiring potential um, on regeneration of Ireland. Um, as th my story, a little bit of my story, and then we go into the story around the potential it offers. Uh, I've spent 10 years in regeneration internationally, and, uh, on a, um, mainly Middle East, on large scale um, regenerations and development to the tune of about 400,000 square meters a year um, and 90 square square acres and um, 90 kilometers, square kilometers every each and every year um, before we move, before I move back to, to Ireland. I'm originally from the garden um, in Waterford. Uh, to do, then we took on the story of around the North East development, which would have been the largest um, regeneration outside Dublin. Uh, we got it through to planning and it's now back over to the council to regenerate out, but, but we're hoping to see about 7,000 jobs created there um, on what is one of the largest sites um, in a key in a, in a city um, in Ireland. Um, but, but through that journey, we realised of so much of the opportunity of what we call community-led regeneration. And I'm just going to give you the kind of the, what we learned and what Ali is doing um, fantastically, and it's going to build onto a story of what could be done, the scale of the opportunity, um, and the same with what Dermot is already doing in Scotland and what Frank and Jude are, are doing in, in the EU. So the good news is um, it's the size of the opportunity. I'm going to fly through this because obviously the slides will go out afterwards. Um, there's a lot of data um, because I make no apologies. We like data to make decisions. Um, but the size of the opportunity is often um, overwhelming for many, but we just we have to start and, and make a better outcome for, for communities. Um, so if, if I go on to the start of it, um, what's the story with towns in Ireland? So I'm not going to focus on cities because cities get an awful lot of attention already. Um, I saw a lot of what we realised. So go to go to the vacancy causes, um, a lot of the root causes, the scale of the opportunity, and some of the solutions. And then there, therefore, where does meanwhile youth come into that uh, and play a big big part of that? Um, so what's the story with towns in Ireland? The, the high level numbers that the kind of we didn't realize until we actually drilled through it, but there's 3.3 million people living in towns and villages in Ireland. So that's twice the scale of cities, all the cities when you combine all the cities. As an economy size and, and for the communities that they are, they're 181 billion a year, which is a, a large number. Um, we're very fortunate in Ireland when you take a global view on things. We've now the most amount of cash in banks in communities in the history of Ireland. So 86 billion of cash on deposit in home. And um, there's a further 50 billion across businesses and central bank allocation for, for towns. Um, retail, if you look at towns, is often get uh, internationally retail is very big, but in Ireland, retail doesn't get a huge amount of focus, which is a so what, which we find fascinating as the, the largest employment sector. But that's a 33 billion a year trade, and retail isn't dying. So there's a lot of false rumors out there. Um, that actually retail is growing about 8% a year and year. Economies and towns are growing about 5% a year and cash is growing about 13% a year and year, which is the highest level of growth in the EU. Um, when you get down into actually the opportunities within town, uh, according to GeoHive and CSO and there's different methodologies, but there's about 128,000 vacant homes or vacant living space opportunities um, in these towns and, and towns across Ireland. That's worth about 28 billion. How do we get to that? That's the average price of every home. And what Ali has done really well, and what we're doing in the background, we're, we're going to share all the data with everybody, is we put a value to that for every single town in Ireland. Um, so that is 
free data for everybody um, because we believe that if we um, share data, we actually get the better results. Living at home, which is the demand side of things, um, and interesting so what is there are 316,000 18 to 14 nine year olds living still at home with mum and dad um, in Ireland. We call that demand for living space. Our cross varies, means it doesn't mean a vacant home, it doesn't mean obsession with new bills. And it does have a, an unhealthy obsession with new bills. But it actually means that these people do need, need living space in some shape or guise. So that's um, more than the population of Cork uh, who are currently at home, lick, backlog in demand, looking for living space. Uh, when we look at towns, Ireland's an interesting dynamic that, that over 138,000 have left towns to move to Dublin or to move to internationally which is a diaspora, um, part of the diaspora, and a huge opportunity to bring them back. So when, I look across, when we look across towns, we see the drivers of vacant are an enormous opportunity to unlock potential, because the most sustainable space is the existing space to be used, um, and far better value than, than a new build, and far cheaper value than many new builds that are affordable, if you like a Dublin of 450,000, question mark, affordable rather than an existing home. Um, the value of that demand for those 18 to 49 year olds living at home across all towns is 15 billion when that is unlocked. So that means they'll be either moving into space uh, in some shape or form. And those 18 to 40 year olds who, if they had remained in town uh, and contributed to their community, our the flip side of the glass half full, could be 7 billion a year in trade. Um, and, and importantly, a segment that seems to be, strangely, when you come back from internationally, women. Um, there are currently 300,000 women who are working at home um, or kept at home, depending on how you view, view things through different policies or lack of policies. And therefore, the opportunity, if they were freed up from the kitchen sink, um, and, and I use that, I've got an enormous positive opportunity would be worth about 16 billion in trade, which is twice the amount of agriculture trade in the countryside. Um, if women at home in work in town alone were, were working are allowed to work controversially. And then really, really importantly, towns are the climate impact of about 48 million tons a year. And the goal to get to net zero, um, towns have an enormous opportunity to get to carbon neutrality. So that's the high level. Okay. Go the town economy. So in summary, towns are an enormous driver of, of Ireland's communities, and and unfairly, I would say, um, not, not 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 sorry, not represented. So what's the vacancy causes? When we look at it, there's there's four four things that we look at. Are going like I said, there's one in six young people have left towns for Dublin across the region, which is 16% of that community are gone. Uh, a cornerstone of communities gone. Brain drain, if you like. I'd, the opportunity now is to bring them back. Um, if that talent is still in town, they pay 13% of their, their income of 40,000 uh, on childcare, which is the highest in OECD. So that's lost trade through high childcare prohibitive um, policies, which could be worked on and improved. Um, so 13%. So they spend twice as much to three times as much as, as a family spends on food and retail than they do on childcare. And, and if, if they choose, if, if the child with childcare is so high, um, that is a key driver. So the childcare costs are the key driver of why women are kept out of the economy. And when you turn it into an opportunity, it could be brought back into town economies uh, when policies come back in line with, with EU. And what's that, what's that worth in terms of, of course, the, 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 the power of women? And the power of women is worth 22 billion a year in town trade, um, which is an enormous amount. And we have that for every single town in Ireland of, of what the opportunity is. And, that, and so in essence, that's trying back into vacancy. If you bring back the talent, if you improve the childcare spaces into those meanwhile uses, because a vacant space could be a crash, it could be a state-led crash. You can put the, whole, the, the home next to the crash. You could put the, the work from home hub next to the crash in every single workhouse because every single town has had a workhouse through generations. 
you're then actually unlocking that space to bring back the talent, put the crash in, enable and help uh, the least fortunate back into work through better childcare, which unlocks women's capability, which unlocks trade spend, which unlocks town growth. And if you add up those four bits alone, and, and if we did that through town communities, it would see over 50% growth in town's economy in the next five years, which has doubled the impact of COVID's decline. So it, it's pretty powerful, of course, addressing these root causes of bring the talent back, fix childcare into vacant spaces, help women back into work and enable them to grow, and give them at least equal the same rights. You actually would double town's trade impact and the impact on communities. So, um, but those are the real drivers of vacancy, not just at the property. Each property and every home, each property and every home is a story. And um, so that's the scale of it. What we're going to do is obviously for, for time, we've got all the calculations done and we're going to give it through Ali um, into CTHC of what it is by county. So the vacant stock at county um, and at national level, the overall the country, the, the value of vacant homes is over 43 billion um, of stock or assets, which is in terms of the housing for all scale per year. It is 10 times the spend that housing for all is spending each and every year. Um, there's 219,000 vacant homes about in terms of demand to move those potentially those into those homes. You have 470,000 young people aged 18 to 49 living at home as demand for homes or spaces if they were regenerated. Um, saving those, if those, some of those homes were regenerated and displaced the new build, it would save 5 million tonnes of CO2 a year, which we pay as taxpayers or towns, we pay 313 million a year in tax for that. Um, and nearly what was interesting of what we've also found out is the obsolescence. When you go through the life cycle of vacancy, um, there, there's an obsolescence rate uh, because they go from vacant into derelict and obsolete. And that is nearly 1 billion of vacant obsolete properties a year or 4,000 homes. So if we, through towns, if we stop the obsolescence, we would actually save 4,000 homes or living spaces with different uses. We then enable people to come back and young people to move out of their homes into more affordable homes with the existing spaces. We have that by count, county. Um, so that's there broken down and kind of what, what it looks like. And then if you looked at applying EU type policies, if we apply the 7% levy uh, on that vacant homes value, it would be a fund of 2.8 billion per annum, applying a 7% charge on the vacant value, uh, which we would be saying, we put that ring fences and use it to regenerate the vacant existing homes in town. Um, so it's a, it's a sizable fund. Put the 2.8 billion in, in perspective, 4 billion of the total tax take increases across every sector. Um, vacant homes, by the way, if we didn't, we're not going to cover in this 10 minutes, but vacant homes have increased in value 50% in the last five years, or 10 billion in value on no tax. Uh, so there's an opportunity there for tax, the 2.8 billion, transfer that ring fence at around, and those are the conversations that I would be having with Ali, and I would strongly recommend to the government of going, use, use the levy um, and put it in to regenerate funds, and then give that tax back to the regional team and down into councils to regenerate vacant and you have 2.8 billion. If you had a 2.8 billion vacant fund and 250,000 average price, you would actually unlock 12,000 vacant homes per year. 12,000 would double the supply um, today uh, for various uses. So we're gonna give, we're gonna live that. And then you've got the obsolescence rate by county. So every county we've got vacant, we've got vacant values, we've got the demand backlog, you got the vacant value, you got the obsolescence cost and you got the carbon cost. So by doing, regenerating some of these, they're already having an implied value of five, five million tons um, is the vacant impact. So Ali, I'm just conscious of time, but, but the goals, the high level goals of, of what Ali's doing um, to CTHC um, means that it's all interlinked and in every community we're all interlinked with stories. And we're gonna hear that as a common theme, but to regenerate the vacant homes, if you got them from the 10%, target to 5% target to get down to EU level would unlock 30,000 homes, reducing vacancy. And I'm just focusing on town. Um, if you brought back, reduce the young, sorry, and then if you went to the next box, you're going reducing the young living at home across these towns, 
you're then reducing that by 100,000 home young people unlocked, which actually adds 5 billion in trade, uh, in local trade, because the trade is then needed to fix, fix up and refurbish the existing vacant. So childcare policies and others, which is if you're relocating the talent back out of Dublin to childcare, and if you did put in the crashes into the vacant building, if you did have 10% more work, if you got to EU, EU levels within five years, it would add 10 billion in trade to town. So you've added the 5 billion in trade of the refurbishment, you've added 10 billion in, in, to the town's economy, and you're actually enabling women, reducing the women at work at home um, by, by 80,000 over five years, which then allows, and then there's an interesting thing about how do you exceed our emission goals in town? So why doesn't towns lead to getting to carbon neutrality? which is 52 towns to leave and getting to zero carbon within five years. And that's partnering up with, with different ways to offset using tree planting, but mainly actually partnerships with international and uh, less fortunate countries um, to saving the rainforest and saving, saving yeah, currently rainforests that are going um, and agricultural rainforests that are getting destructed. If towns partnered up with, with other programs internationally, you could actually get to carbon neutrality within five years tree planting um, and that how we do that we finance that is, is actually just unlocking the funds we've got 85 billion cash and deposits getting no return in communities and expanding what credit unions do because credit unions actually keep the cash in communities um, and, and measuring all of that I put that down here to the SDGs the focus on women far better climate outcomes the, the kids living at home uh, and vacancy and dereliction which stops obsolescence means that the strategic development goals and the CSO become key in measuring success. Um, so that's, that's I'm, I'm running, I'm gonna give this out because I've gone over my time limit, but what we've just done is we've, we've actually, with Ali, we've actually applied this to, to the top 15 towns in the CTHC uh, as a model and going, okay, so that means that we regenerate 166 million vacant in value there's 10,000 homes that are vacant in these, these only 15 homes to actually start to get momentum. And, we group, and essentially, we create a little bit of competition between the towns to see who can get implementing as fast as possible to actually get people into homes, to get to, to unlock the spirit of communities and to tap into the diaspora um, who have got, who have done all of this. And, and that's, and that's my, my summary, which is we have done all of these solutions um, in the EU already. You're going to hear that from Jude and Frank. This isn't, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not putting men on Mars. We're actually just doing what has already been done in all the other countries already, because towns are already vital with being so large. They often get underlooked, but when you have communities unlocking their power through stories and through diaspora uh, and, and a purpose of giving young people and at the least and the least fortunate, a better outcome and better futures. It's a great purpose to have. So it's not a question of what we do, it's, it's how fast we can go um, and, and getting people involved in sharing that uh, across the piece. So um, to prove that it's already been done, I'm gonna hand over to Dermot because he's another diaspora who's done absolutely amazing stuff in Scotland. He's another Southeast, um, the Asper legend um, to be tapped into. Um, but it's great to be able to see that this is already being done elsewhere in the EU, the question of how fast we can go. So, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Rob. Um, yeah, you've stopped screen sharing, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm actually just before I move, to, we've, we've got the video from uh, Dermot from Scotland, but just before I move to that, I want to just give just a moment for people to feed in some of their reflections um, fairly quickly, and then we'll see uh, we'll see if you want to add anything. So we'll, we'll hear more from Rob um, as, as the afternoon goes on, so he'll, he'll be able to res respond to some of the different presentations that uh, we're doing. Um, if I share my screen, we're go there's where are we now 140 of us on the call which is completely wonderful um we're going to use this a uh, little bit of software this app called uh, mentimeter so if you you've a variety of ways of getting in there you can use the qr code 
or you can uh, go to you know, click on your uh, a tab on your computer or uh, go, use your smartphone, go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And we have an event code for what we're doing today, which is 27745443. And uh, oh, someone's already found the reaction button. So we're getting some, some hearts as well, which is lovely. And the first question, I'm going to ask, and we're, just, we're not going to ask loads of questions. It's not a big kind of intimidating thing, but it's just, you know, with 140 people or something on the call, it's nice, it's nice just to get a bit of feedback uh, and also recognise there are diverse perspectives. So different people see different things. So um, I think Rob was really good there and highlighting, uh, you know, the interconnectedness of the problem and, and, and also the scale of the problem. Uh, but just, yeah, for yourselves, the, the 140 people on this call, what are some of the different things we might say about the problems in Ireland? And, and obviously there's lots and lots of different things that we might say. Um, one of the nice things using Mentimeter is as you see other people's responses, if you agree very much, then you can just repeat what they've said. It's not like being in school where copying somebody else is uh, a, a problem, but actually if 10 people say silos or six people say no joined up thinking, then when we come to the results at the end or even just watching what's on the screen now, seeing the same things again and again is, um, you know, it gives a message. Uh, equally, if you see something you think, no, that, actually, that's not quite it, it's slightly different, then we'll give you a minute or two to, to respond to that. So, uh, I don't know, Rob, if you're uh, with us as well, you, you can join in here with the things you're seeing on the screen, if there's anything you particularly want to respond to. So, are you saying you can't? I'm just trying to get, get the common problem. Um, I'm just, I've got back on that. So the lack of opportunities for longer term careers within town. Problem or opportunity? Yeah. Each one of these can be solved. Um, it is complex. There is an obsession with property owner, but everything can be solved. Um, is my view on, on life. And all of these problems have been solved by elsewhere. So it's a question of how, how we fix them, where we can fix them. I think the great thing about CTHC or Town Centre First policy, it, it's needed now. Um, but you, we, we can try, given the scale of towns in Ireland, try lots of different things in different towns and bring it back together to a common web. And we're going to see that with Dearmouth. That's what Mean Wild Youth does. They're good. You could try something different in the garden, something different in Kilkenny, something different in New Ross, something different in Galway, something different in Kerry. And, and everything is trying different problems, feeding back to say, OK, that's great. We've tried lots of different things to solve the problem. I, that's, a, that's, that's our enormous opportunity because you, you, every problem is actually, if you look at it with a glass half full, an opportunity um, to actually change better outcomes. Um, agree that there's an awful, there's a green box there, which is my values, but the lack of ambition and evidence based intervention already proved like, uh, elsewhere. That's a massive problem, is the inertia. A uh, root cause of that is leadership. Uh, going, it's, it's not just the ambition, it's we have a purpose to make people's outcomes better. If you're not leaving a legacy of better outcomes, we've really got to say we have to change it for communities. And that's the, the power of communities is going to quickly change it when they want to. Um, what are the other things popping up to the screen there? This joint to data and systems. Yeah, um, but data isn't, data isn't everything. It's going, we can, the power of data these days is business intelligence and others can quickly form it together. Universities play a big role in that um, and crowdsourcing plays a massive role in, in providing data. Um, I said, it's going so fast I can't read, Chris, so being a man... No, like, don't, don't, no don't, don't, don't worry about it at all, Rob. That's, that, that's really good that you've been able to respond so much to what you've seen Something on that one which is fascinating relative to Ireland and other countries. The institutional inertia and in civil servants is a point there. Absolutely. The civil servants are outstanding at managing the status quo. There's absolutely zero ability on leading change, which is, that, which is fine. The solution to that would be how you put the government to say one group is driving change, one group is driving status quo. But the DNA of someone driving change is very different to DNA driving status quo. You need both. But, but Ireland 
has the biggest opportunity to go put a dedicated delivery group. And that's what Scotland and Nirmid will show you. And, and Judith, got, I'm guessing, going to show about if you put dedicated teams on it, it the potentials are lost. Um, but if you're still expecting the, dead, the, the status quo in departments to pick up and lift vacancy or meanwhile use, it's not happening. It needs the communities to actually go, okay, this is our baby, pick it up and drive it um, and lead. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, no, that, that's, that's, that's really, really good. We will share the slides and we will share the product from the Mentimeter. So, and again, if you, if you, some of us take a, a little bit longer to quite get our thoughts together than others. So if you go back into the Mentimeter in the next few minutes, your, uh, your input will still be logged and we'll kind of, you know, go into the kind of the output from the day, uh, all of which is just uh, really, really good. So if you just bear with me for a second, I will line up, um, Dermot Lawler from um, Scottish Futures. Oh, and let's just, oh, we've admitted somebody else, so 140 odd people. So yes, Dermot, we've already mentioned a few times, uh, originally from New Ross, uh, now with the Scottish Futures Trust for the last year or so. Before that, he was the Director of Place with Architecture and Design Scotland. So he's clearly in this space and as, uh, Rob's been talking and other people have been mentioning in, in, in the responses, um, there's a lot we can learn from other countries. So it is really, really good that uh, Dermot has prepared this video for us. Uh, Dermot originally had hoped to be with us in, in the session and still hopes to join us kind of for the last bit of the session, uh, maybe, but has really uh, kindly, um, yeah, re really kindly put the uh, put the effort into to make this video. So let's just share the screen and we'll make sure we get uh, all the right buttons working. And we'll make it big and go with Dermot. Hello, good afternoon, and thanks so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I'm Dermot Lawler, originally from Neuros, but now I'm working in Scotland with the Scottish Futures Trust, the National Infrastructure for Company for Scotland. And I work on, on place, on place-based approaches to collaboration, to make more of what we already have, to better support communities to achieve their needs to be the best that they can be. And today, I'd just like to share some reflections, some insights, some projects from Scotland around the work that's going on. It's a work in progress, of course it is, as it is in every place, but hopefully some of the insights and uh, examples here might be of interest and really welcome the discussion, really welcome the collaboration, really welcome to shared learning between us as nations and thank you. I'd like to start off the discussion by focusing in on the why. Why is it important that the places we have need to work better for the people we have to be the best that they can be? And I'd like to start that discussion by referencing a story from a fantastically talented artist and educator in, in Ireland, Joe Caslin. And Joe's practice is to create massive murals on spaces across the country so the entire community see the rest of the community. This image is on the Ardry Hotel, the empty Ardry Hotel in Waterford, one of the most powerful modernist structures in that part of the country. And, and it relates to uh, young people. It's a key theme in, in Joe's wor work. It's around showing the people and the community and all of us around, not just uh, the presence of young people, but some of the anxieties and potentials of young people and to invite discussion around our collective responsibility to help them. A number of years ago, I had the great privilege to be part of a conference on the Three Sisters bid, Three Sisters bid, excuse me, um, for the, the European Capital of Culture, this fantastic idea of creating a new cultural union between Kilkenny, Wexford and Waterford to, to bid for this capital of culture. An amazing opportunity. Inside it, Joe uh, came in and he presented, and I'll never forget the first couple of minutes of his presentation. He said as a teacher, when kids came back in September time, oftentimes over his practice, he noticed that sometimes in some classes, a young person was missing. And sometimes in those classes, it's because that young person was suffering from anxiety. Sometimes in some classes, that's because that young person, unfortunately, had taken their life. This troubled Joe greatly. He asked the question of why is it in the places we have, in the communities we have, in the spaces we have, young people aren't able to find the space for nurture. They aren't able to find the relationships for protection. 
they aren't able to find the opportunities to be. So I guess the, 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 the image here on, on the Audrey is, is showing people around us the needs of people. And that's the key part of why we need to reimagine the places we already have. We need to reimagine the potential of what we already have. We need to challenge, provoke, organize and discuss the potential of what we already have to deliver better outcomes, to deliver better opportunities, to deliver better pathways for everybody in the community. And the key part of that is we already have assets. We already have infrastructure. We already have stuff. So the question is how we reimagine the stuff to better deliver on the needs of the people. In Scotland, a number of years ago, kind of supporting that general idea of outcomes and impacts, the Christie Commission was convened because it was identified that the way that public services work sometimes often fragments uh, the, the different activities of things. And Campbell Christie was convened to look at the future of public services. And the Christie Commission said, we need to reimagine the services to better support people in communities by gearing everything we do around prevention. So everything we do needs to be geared to create the kind of places, the kind of environment that stops things that we don't want to happen happening. Number two, everybody then works on that bit, no matter who you are, the street cleaner, the nurse, the social worker, the Garda, the people in the school, the investor, everybody's all about that. Number three, everybody is involved. It's an opportunity for direct participation by community service users and providers. Number four, you can't do it alone. It's about partnership. So the Christie Commission says the future of the way services work, which support communities, which use the spaces that we have, is about those four things of prevention, performance, participation and partnership. And that has set up an interesting and powerful challenge for Scotland. It has tried to deliver against it and it's still a work in progress, but it's a really powerful starting point. People then into the purpose and then from the purpose then to start thinking about the spaces and places we already have. Currently, Scottish Government then and the, the, the partnerships and the local authorities and the businesses in Scotland are looking at how to build on that idea of those pillars of public sector reform and bring agendas together. So it's not about trying to do those things separately, bring the agendas together, bring the agenda of the transition to net zero together with the agenda around making better sustainable places, together with the agenda around inclusive economies and opportunities for all. And as that Venn diagram of policy agendas kind of comes together, it means that we need to try and get more impact from every space. So it's less about single purpose spaces doing single jobs. It's more about multifunctional spaces in multifunctional places delivering a multitude of outcomes for people. As we start to run that through, then the opportunity really comes up of reimagining what we already have to create the world that we really need. Supporting some of this work has been the funding landscape and a really great part of that has been the Regeneration Capital Grants Fund, which is focused on outcomes, it's focused on learning and it's focused on improvement. And so the Regeneration Capital Grants Fund is about communities and partners bidding for capital to get behind uh, some of the projects that they need um, for community success. Often uh, communities would come forward with a bid and they would get denied and they would get encouraged to, to look at the governance or the outcomes or some of the delivery bits and then they're welcome back in the next bit. So this idea of an ongoing learning framework is a really powerful and successful part of the landscape of creating a meanwhile culture. And I've just shown two examples here. One is, is Leith, uh, Leith Work, where it's brought together the health service and community partners as a community hub. And the second is in a smaller area, Millport on the west of Scotland, where they're repurposing an old hole and then extending bits into it to connect up opportunities for the community. So the Regeneration Capital Grants bit is very much about how is it going to help people, how are you going to do it, and how is it going to work. Supporting that in Scotland at the moment and building on the Regeneration Capital Grants Fund is the place-based approach, which is trying to get more collaboration more often with more people for more impact. And, 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 and that's supported by uh, a, an investment programme of 325 million over the next five years, but, it, but it's also founded on these three key principles. Number one is the idea of the place principle, which is an expectation of collaboration by Scottish government and local government. Secondly, uh, an appraisal framework, a financial kind of uh, appraisal framework in development that's looking at the way that the outcomes 
are going to be achieved by bringing together the assets and resources in the place as part of the application for funding. And then thirdly, it's the funding itself and the performance thereof. So that the place approach is just a pragmatic way of getting partnership to work around uh, shared outcomes, making more of the spaces and places we already have. And that place-based approach then is also supported by the particular uh, infrastructure investment hierarchy that has been published in the, the recent infrastructure plan in Scottish Government. And it now requires public investment to move through this hierarchy. The first part is to demonstrate the need. What is the needs of the young people, the older people, the community? What are the needs? Not, not, not what is the thing we would like to do, but what are the needs? So that requires a community conversation, that requires participation, that requires challenge, and it requires some kind of development. So the needs bit is number one. Secondly, with those needs, and if we're clear on the story of the future we want, then we can be clear on how we could reuse, reimagine, and repurpose what we already have, be that spaces, places, infrastructures, and partnerships. So the, the, the first step is to reimagine. Number three, once we've started to look at that, is there an opportunity to bring things together, services together, partners together, um, infrastructure together? And then finally, as we've moved through that, then what is the case for new build, if any? So, so this hierarchy becomes a really important principle of leveraging what we have, focusing on impact. And supporting that, I, I, I think that the, the COVID experience and the acceleration of digital and the, uh, the opening up of settings for work from home to local, to headquarters, to beyond, then starts to kind of create a different conversation about the world of work. And that world of work then starts to look at activities, what activities are we doing, how do we organise our people skills, how do we organise our technologies, how do we organise our processes, so that the world of work then becomes an opportunity to be more local, and to be more local is an opportunity to think more local, to reopen spaces that we already have to support new and different ways of people gathering and moving together. So just to kind of go back over that, they start with the folk, then kind of move through the priorities in the place and the needs piece, then start to reimagine what we already have and inside that then start to link that to the context of new and different ways of working, new and different ways of organising. And so in Scotland, a number of different projects have come forward around those principles. This is the uh, Dumbarton Town Hall, which is West Dumbartonshire Council chose to relocate their headquarters from an old building which was unsuitable into the town centre. So the locational choice was to locate in the town centre and also to locate and use an existing listed building which was of meaning to the community. So to adapt what we already have and then connect that to create modern workspace, modern office space, public realm and heritage value which also becomes a catalyst for the way the wider regeneration works. And, 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 and a key part of that was a deliberate decision to locate in the place and make use of the assets of the place to create the kind of environment that we need to catch up the opportunities. Another part of that though, is then to start looking at how to build the capabilities to do different, the capabilities to do joined up, the capabilities to reimagine, repurpose the partnerships. This is the Stove Project and the Middle Steeple Quarter in Dumfries, a fantastic uh, initiative community led by artists, creatives and partnerships to take an entire block of a town centre, so clusters of buildings, um, buy that out and then start to reimagine how that could work to better serve the needs of the community, to attract and retain different people with co-working, enterprise space, workshops, living spaces uh, and public spaces. So, so this is the community really taking on the role of developer partner and introducing creativity in the thought and an innovation in the partnerships of remaking what we already have. Another part of that is, is that sometimes uh, we have spaces that might lie empty for a period or it might be difficult to know who has it. So a good opportunity that's emerged, and I know it's emerged uh, at home as well, has been to use these spaces as spaces to develop evidence, a try before you buy. These photographs are taken from a, a national initiative called Stole Space, but also a Glasgow City initiative, which is which is of a similar kind of name, which builds up community projects for a temporary period in spaces and places across the city to support community growing, to support uh, teaching foreign languages to, to, to migrants, to um, creating learning spaces for young people, to creating outdoor cinemas. So to unlock the potential of the spaces we have 
to link it with the capability and ambition of the communities and then to evidence, to evidence how the need can be met by making more of what we already have. Uh, and, and, and then that kind of builds into how you know the, the mid steeple idea and the evidencing idea then start to get into some of the integrated funding and integrated partnerships to deliver outcomes like living. This is the Glengate Hall in Kerimura, a very small, beautiful town in Angus. Um, it was lying vacant for a number of years. It was again meaningful for the community as part of the conservation area. They identified it was a priority to look at. And then they started to build up a partnership around repurposing this building into living. They brought together um, money from uh, one fund, the Empty Homes Fund, also the Conservation Fund, and also the private builders. So they created a cocktail, and then with that cocktail, built up a collaborative partnership that allowed them to convert an empty building to occupation for a variety of households in about 14 months. And what I thought was really interesting around that project was how they were able to target the project funding to different parts. So some funding went to the structure, some funding went to the skin, some funding went to the internal fit out. So, so that collaboration then had a framework for how the money went in to do the different jobs, to create the different spaces. Uh, and that needs to be fantastic living environments that have changed the nature of some households of people that couldn't access the housing ladder. And some people that needed to expand with family, but the affordability was an issue, delivering fantastic outcomes for the community. The final slide, I think is that one of the, the key things about making more of what we already have is not the technical feasibility of it, that's technically possible. It's not the funding feasibility of it, that's possible, although it's difficult. It's stories that sway. It's making the possible plausible, but not just plausible, but desirable. So I'll go back to the beginning. The, the, the reason to start at the beginning with the people is that the impact and outcome story must lead all the activities from choosing which buildings, to, to choosing the partners, to choosing the money, uh, to, to, to then delivering the impact. But the thing that starts it off are stories that sway the outcome and impact stories that really help people to reimagine the full potential of what we already have. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, to Dermot, who hopefully will be joining us a little bit uh, later. Um, before, so we'll move pretty quickly on to Jude and Frank to talk about their research in Ireland. But just before we do that, I wanted to give Rob and uh, Ali, if they wanted the opportunity, just if they want to comment on anything that's particularly striking them from the Scottish experience about the lessons that we should be learning or things that feel particularly relevant. Um, yeah. Re relevant to us. So, uh, Rob, maybe you might yeah, want to go first. I think it's fascinating oh, and you, learning. You've got a big water noise there, unless it's. Oh, hang on. Oh, that, so, that'll be me. I'll get rid of that. Climate change just creeped up on my mountain that I live on uh, and flooded. No, I think it's fascinating because to, to see. Dermot has already delivered. That's the first learning. This is already being applied in Scotland. That, that it's something that we could pick up and drive as a country and then reinvent the wheel. Fascinating that they look at future needs. I think there's an obsession in Ireland on housing for all, but actually they're going, how do we make best use of existing first? And right down the hierarchy is new. Um, that they're really listening based on future needs and really listening to community part of the dialogue um that's that's fascinating from a rational perspective the capital outcomes and having clear outcomes uh, that it's something that's, that's missing in ireland which is going there's not much numbers placed to outcomes on appraisals but they have a method and the funding the funding models are fascinating we don't we've not tapped yes in ireland as a country into the opportunity to unlock community capital community developer but the community is the developer not private not state, the community. It's a whole pillar in Ireland that's missing that exists in most countries around the world, except Ireland. And I think if we bring in that pillar, we'll unlock community potential um, hugely. So that was kind of my learning. Um, I, I, I love the stories, obviously, it, 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 because it's stories that way. You're, you're working to a purpose. Purpose then drives you to overcome the, the challenge of, of change and, and inertia, which is 
you set the outcomes, you set the purpose, communities will then get involved and say, here's well, where we want to go, here's what we want to leave behind. And they'll blast through barriers, um, a political or whatever, go and let's just make it happen. Because it's, 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 it's fantastic. Um, so it's, it's an inspiring thing to say, Dermot and the rest of the team of what he's done. That was my learning going, it's easy to just pick it, pick it up and go. Let's go. Ali? Brilliant. Yeah, do you want to add anything, Ali? Yeah, I just think the whole sort of, you know, there's a lot more thinking in terms of, you know, how can we improve the systems? You know, we need partnership, prevention, just those kind of principles at the start that everybody can buy into, you know, and everybody can sort of run with. What really struck me as well, it's very sort of people-based, people-focused, um, which I think is, you know, that's really what we need to get to. Um, and we do a lot of work in the Heritage Council with communities. So, I mean, that is just so, so important going forward. And also, you know, making sure that our communities have leaders and that there's leadership there and training for them, you know. Um, and also it's about asset management. So, yeah, I mean, there's lots of learnings really from Scotland. I find it very exciting to listen to Dermot. You know, I've, I've been in a few meetings with him now. So, yeah, it's all it's all good. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alison. So, um I, I really get as well, as well as the people focusing, you, you, you're commenting on there, the uniqueness of places. So, you know, the, the, the place-based approach that actually has the capacity to respond to the, the uniqueness, what's special, what the particular needs are uh, in every single place. It's very impressive. Very, very good. Um, good. Right. So hopefully we're uh, on schedule and that sets us up well for... Uh, Jude and Frank, who are going to give us a presentation about their work uh, with Anish. And um, I suspect a lot of you know them already, so I'm not necessarily sure I need to uh, in introduce the two of you terribly much, but uh, I'm delighted to uh, be heading off into a world with uh, sharing economy and circular economy and transdisciplinary and all these kind of words to the fore. So, uh, Jude and Frank, do you want to? Uh, take the floor and share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Imagine. Yes, I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine an Irish town that you went to recently. Put yourself back there for a moment. Now imagine if everyone in the town had a home, a place to play and create, and a place to walk nearby. What if I told you this was possible? What if I told you we didn't have to build anything new to make giant steps forward towards achieving this? What if I told you the high vacancy and dereliction rates we experience in so much of our towns can be turned into an opportunity to achieve all of these things? Homes, places to play, create and work. And what if I told you many other countries would love to have the opportunity to be custodians of our wonderful, very much underappreciated architecture and heritage? Over the past three years, Jude and I have been trying to understand why we, have, why we have such high vacancy and dereliction in Ireland and why we so undervalue our priceless heritage. And what this ridiculous waste is doing to our communities, our environment and our economy. 16 months ago, we started a Twitter conversation through a daily dose of dereliction, focusing on a two kilometre radius of Cork City. Over time, the conversations moved to other forms of media and generated discussions and debates nationwide. A movement called Derelict Ireland has emerged from our work, which has gone mainstream these past few months. In fact, we have our second walking festival to end our election in Dublin this Saturday. The first one was in September in Cork and was in partnership with CATU, the Tenants Union. The second one in Dublin is in partnership with CATU, but also with Reclaim Our Spaces and once again takes a peaceful cultural emphasis with guides, poultry, music and more. Along with shining a light and challenging, we've also been looking at solutions. As sustainable designers, we take a system perspective, seeking solutions comes naturally to us. 
and this includes policy solutions. In fact, I've been working on policy development and implementation in sustainability and resources for 20 years, due for a decade for national governments, the UN and European Commission. We have used our expertise and our time pro bono to develop a toolbox of policy measures we believe will be transformative in terms of vacancy and dereliction in Ireland. Through funding from the Heritage Council, we've gone in deeper into one such instrument, Meanwhile Use, to explore what this could potentially do for Ireland. From our research, we are convinced it can play a key role in bringing vacancy to acceptable levels and thus reducing the gateway to dereliction. But it can also do much more than this. The result of all this research, reflection and ideation is Labate. But before we go into what Labate involves, Jude will share some insights from our Meanwhile Use Best Practice Research Study funded by the Heritage Council. So I'll present just one case study um, today. In our report, we've looked at four case studies, four international case studies, one in Glasgow, in Glasgow to stall spaces, one in Denmark and one, one in Northern Ireland, just looking at different how different meanwhile use programs are implemented, what their different objectives are. But we'll look first and we'll go into more detail in Amsterdam. And I've chosen Amsterdam to go into more detail here because it's a longer running meanwhile use program. And it really, it comes from a, a culture and a challenge of tackling vacancy and dereliction. Now, Amsterdam, Ireland's not unique in its vacancy and dereliction problems. Other countries are facing the same or faced the same in the past. So for, um, for example, in Amsterdam in the 70s and 80s, there was massive dereliction and vacancy across the whole city. There was a large problem with land speculation. And because of that, then there was a huge housing crisis at the same time. Now, Amsterdam was becoming a city that was unlivable. Its city population dropped about 15% between the 80s, 70s and 80s. So all the city, all the families were like in Ireland, were obsessed with living in the suburbs. So there was massive suburban flight going on. So in order to tackle that, it came from the people as, who were living in the city, the families who were from the city wanted the city to be family friendly again. They wanted it to be livable again. So they've done a number of things. They got up on the streets to make their voices heard but they also started to squat buildings. And when I say squat buildings, I don't mean it was a, a group of young students who took over a building and just partied the whole time. These were families looking for play spaces for their kids. It was communities looking for to save their heritage buildings that were going to be demolished or left to decay and fall down. But it was also creatives and artists who were looking for free spaces to use, to experiment, innovate, to try new things and to give Amsterdam its creative atmosphere that it still has today. Now that, through those uh, different approaches, Amsterdam was successful in maintaining its heritage, its heritage, historic core, and has became the Amsterdam that we all, famous Amsterdam that we all know now. And, and, that, and when Amsterdam started to boom again and become livable again, and when it started to tackle its vacancy, reduces its vacancy rates and reducing its dereliction, it started to run out of these spaces where creatives were able to use. Now, also when I say squatting, it was squatting to use a space, not necessarily to gain ownership. And um, so it was to look at how do we make sure spaces are used. So as it became, started boom again, it started to run out of these creative spaces. Now, Amsterdam, in the 90s recognized the importance of having creatives in its city. It recognizes the importance to innovation, to its economy, to its livability, that creative use, creatives and artists are needed, they need to be embedded in a community and they need to have space to grow, to breed in order to be, have a, a successful city. So Amsterdam in 1999 set up its creative incubator policy and out of that, then created its Bureau de Broadplatzen. So it's the Office of Breeding Grounds. Now this office sits within the Comente of Amsterdam, which is the Amsterdam Council. Um, and it's run by the Amsterdam Council and it's funded by the Amsterdam Council. Now currently there, this is a map of all their uh, Broadplatzen. So it's, a, it's about 1,200 spaces, artist spaces, and about 100 homes across the city. 
Now, this works in Amsterdam because owners of vacant sites and vacant buildings have a cost. And there used to be a fear of squatting. Squatting was outlawed in 2010, so it's not quite the same fear of squatting that used to be consistent with making or that would drive an owner to go and use their space and make sure it's used. What, what came about when squatting became more common practice, what came about from squatting was called anti-crack or no fun or anti-squatting. So instead of, if you had a vacant building, if you were a developer or a vacant site and you knew you weren't gonna do anything for a certain amount of time, instead of risking squatters coming into it, you let other people use the space for free, you sign a legal contract. So the users of that space become the custodians of the building or the site. They make sure squatters can't get in, they make sure it's maintained, they make sure it's well kept, but they also then open up the space to to the community to use as well. So there's a whole variety of different anti-crack uses, sometimes homes, but a lot of the time is public uses. So when Amsterdam outlawed um, squatting, it brought in a legal format around meanwhile use through its broad platform. And this was to help, as I said, help make sure that creative still had a space within the city. Now, and this is with Amsterdam's low vacancy rate. So for homes, it currently has a vacancy rate of 2% and 6% for retail. So even with these low vacancy rates, way lower than what we've got in Ireland, four, five, six times lower than in Ireland, it's still using these progressive approaches to make sure all its land, and all the spaces is being used. Now, because Amsterdam had this proactive approach, had these models in place, had these programs in place, when the crash happened in 2008, it was ready for it. So this is an example on the Vibarstraat in the east of Amsterdam. And um, this is a dual carriageway road. It's the only 50 kilometer road that goes right into the city center. It's, there were six offices based here. So these are six offices based along this road. Now in 2007, these were the headquarters of all the major national newspapers. They all left the city. They re relocated out of the city. The plan was they sold off the buildings there was plans put, being put in place to demolish the buildings and have a complete redevelopment of the area. It never happened. The crash happened instead. All major development plans were halted all across the world. Amsterdam was no different to anywhere else. But instead of leaving these places empty, they opened them up. And they opened them up to a whole variety of creative spaces. So what was once a dead office space at the weekends, in the evenings, there was these would be a dead space. So I know I lived actually just around the corner from these spaces, from these offices. They became thriving places. This area of Amsterdam now is the new hipster area of Amsterdam. It's got cafes, restaurants, nightclubs, hotels. It's got everything. It's thriving. It's a living space, and it's just so so full of life. Now these offices, there's only one of those buildings. They all exist, all those buildings, none of them were demolished, but only one of them is now still an office. Another one is turned into homes, one's turned into schools, one's a student accommodation, and another is a co-working space and a swimming pool. And then another one's called Folks Hotel, which we'll have a look at a little bit now in more detail. So the Folks Hotel was 10,000 meters squared of space. Now, Amsterdam's a massively densely populated area, of the, or, densely populated city. So this was a huge space that was given over. The owners went, they knew when the plans were being, when the crash happened and the plans were being scrapped, they went to Comente straight away and to try and find users for these spaces because vacant buildings come at a cost to the owners. And generally in Amsterdam, when an owner of a vacant or, or derelict sites, they go to the council, local councils or the local authorities to find users to come into these spaces. And that's because of the costs associated with them. So for a hectare of a vacant site in Amsterdam can cost anywhere between 40 to 50,000 a year to keep it maintained, to pay its taxes, to keep it secure. And so the meanwhile use offers the owners a massive potential to reduce those costs. It takes the cost off them. So Urban Resort was an organization that worked with Gemente. They took over, over a meanwhile use for a three to six year period for the whole building with an initial three year period and then was extended to six years. They'd done that through uh, getting a loan from the council um, to make sure the building was safe and was reused. The council worked with them then to make sure that they could pay that back. And they'd done that by their legal agreement was that 40% of the space had to be rented out to creatives, people on lower incomes, 
and then the rest of the space could be created rented out to commercial uses restaurants conference centers restaurants all done low key all done on quite cheaply affordably using your imagination and using your creativity to use spaces so I really revolutionized or regenerated a whole area and that's Amsterdam takes an approach where it doesn't just look at one building and making sure that that building's used to make sure that space is used. It takes a whole area approach. And what happened in Vibaustad is that it's taken, it's evolved into the knowledge mile and it's created this room for innovation where this area of Amsterdam has a lot of challenges. As I said, it has a dual carriageway through it. It has so air pollution, noise levels associated with that. And so they're using this innovation spaces, the mean while use spaces to overcome those challenges as a living lab to experiment, to co-work, co-create with the local communities and, and look at new ways of doing things. Now, if we have a look at our towns in Ireland, there's many challenges that we all know our towns are facing. And this picture of Gort explores some of them. There's not many people around. There's absolutely zero greenery. There's no public seating. This was taken on one of the hottest days of the year and there's nobody around. These places should be thriving. But they're, they're beautiful, unique places that are built on amazing design principles to create beautiful homes, nice big windows, three-story terraced houses that have could have beautiful public spaces in front of them. But our towns are, are slowly decaying, they've been de declining for quite a long time at this stage. And through the CTHC program has shown that our towns have a high level of vacancy, both on commercial level, on commercial buildings and on, on, re on, on homes as well. But that high level of vacancy on retail offers and commercial buildings offers a massive opportunity to experiment, to really explore the future of town livings in Ireland. We have to re radically reevaluate how we live in Ireland and how our towns function and survive. And meanwhile, use is an amazing opportunity to, to experiment within that. But I'm, and so we, our work that me and Frank done, um, self-funded work on dereliction in Cork looked at the impact that dereliction is having on our built environment. And this shows that a study of 340 properties within two kilometers of Cork City, Ireland, shows that the vast majority of those derelict buildings are, are, are heritage buildings. Half of them are in areas that are meant to be, our architecture is meant to be conserved. And a quarter of them are so important that they've put on the national inventory of architectural heritage, but yet they're left to decay and left to disappear. And that's it really is destroying, this is all over Ireland, it's destroying our town centres and it's making them un, unlivable. And unfortunately, Meanwhile Use has had a bad rep in Ireland. And this is the site of what was previous a Meanwhile Use project in Cork City. Um, Sample Studios took it over and um, created a really vibrant artist studio spaces for public use and for artists as well. Now, unfortunately, the building was demolished in 2018 and within less than a year later, BAM, who owned the site, um, were looking to sell the site straight away. So they, they got planning permission, they've demolished the site and then they're just looking to sell the site on rather than doing anything. Now, BAM are a Dutch company. And when we talk to friends in the Netherlands, they really struggle to understand how BAM practice this has happened in Ireland compared to what happened in the Netherlands. So the example I gave earlier of the buildings in Amsterdam, the artists weren't actually, the artists are still in a lot of those spaces. So they made sure when Meanwhile Use made sure that the artists maintained their spaces within the, the areas to make sure that they maintained that innovation. But unfortunately, this is what we're faced with after Meanwhile Use in Ireland. This is draining our economy. It's draining the neighborhoods and it's draining our cities. And, and this is happening all over Ireland town centers as well. And now, unfortunately, we see buildings in Ireland as disposable items. There's too much demolition happening. And as, as Rob pointed out, the vacancy and the dereliction buildings that we've got in Ireland, there are carbon sinks for us. They are holding carbon that if we demolish them and create new buildings, it can take up to 80 years to repay that new carbon that's being produced, put that new building in place. So the most sustainable building is the existing building. And unfortunately, vacancy is the gateway to dereliction. So we need to make sure that we 
get into an empty building as quickly as possible to make sure it's used for as long as possible to avoid the eventual demolition and the waste associated with that. Now in the Europe, half of our raw materials go to construction and material costs are massively escalating. And 12% of our greenhouse gases also go into construction of new buildings. So if we're able to maintain the existing buildings we're, we've got, through taking a circular economy approach to our buildings, we can have a massive opportunity to achieve our UN Sustainable Development Goals, to create the reno renovation wave under the Green Deal, and to really reduce our environmental impact of creating new homes and creating creative spaces in our town centres. And to unlock the vacancy, meanwhile, use true Labate, true a hotbed of act activity with our communities is the key way to achieve the quickest way, the cheapest way, and the most creative way to achieve those goals. So welcome to Labate. And so based on our final best practice, we propose that Labate is set up as a non-profit intermediate organization, implement the meanwhile use program in Ireland. Labate, our hotbed, is, is based on a proven effective policy approach with returning commercial vacant properties and into use for benefit of everyone, from the owner to the user, from the community to the authorities. The, the approach creates a level playing field with a transparent process, which in turn enables scale over time. Its role will include taking on liabilities, liaising between the stakeholders, maintaining the properties. This type of approach spot huge success in the Netherlands, as Judith said, and it's resulted in significant innovation in business models and use of spaces, as well as very low vacancy rates. We see Labate as a win-win-win for the owner, for the user, and for the community. Sitting under a town centre first policy and located between the Department of Taoiseach and Department of Finance, and part of a larger toolbox of measures with a minimum 10 year funding commitment, we see no reason why Labate can be introduced within 12 months in Ireland for a one year pilot and within two years of full rollout. From our research, we are convinced this potentially can bring 30 to 40% of commercial properties back into use quickly and cheaply in our towns. It will not only greatly reduce our vacancy and dereliction, it will also help build the community and the local economy, strengthen well-being, sense of place, as well as our mental and physical health, health. So not only is it an economic issue, it is also a public health service and a boost for the community. But there is more. From our research, we can see a huge opportunity to stimulate creativity and innovation in our towns. And this is where Labate gets even more exciting. Labate will function as an innovation living lab to turn the current challenges of high vacancy and dereliction into opportunities to reimagine our town centres. This can be truly transformative as a means to stimulate and build the community and local economy, boost creativity, culture, innovation and entrepreneurship. With a focus on foundational, circular, sustainable and local, thus contributing to tackling our climate, resource and biodiversity crisis as well as our circular economy uh, action plans. This is another step forward in community-led and heritage-led regeneration of our Irish towns. We believe all Irish towns can flourish if we truly tackle vacancy and dereliction. Labate can be the next step forward in creating towns where everyone is a home, a place to play and create, and a place to work. We can do this, everyone. We have the instruments. We now need the cultural and political will and we need to want it, and we need to collaborate to make it happen. Do we want to shake things up and disrupt vacancy and dereliction? I really hope we do. The outcomes will be transformative, benefiting for everyone from an eight to an eight-year-old. Here's your first opportunity. How about meanwhile use for all of the Bank of Ireland premises that are being closed at the moment? A chance for the Bank of Ireland to give something back after all we've helped them out in the past. Now that's some food for thought. So thank you for listening. Thank you to Ali for believing in our unique approach of combining policy, practice and protest. And thanks to Heritage Council for the funding to allow us to delve deep into this particular policy instrument. We really hope you can join us in Dublin on Saturday with Reclaim Our Spaces, Cato and Friends to celebrate what we have, to shine a light on what we are losing and wasting and to show what 
heritage really matters and we can end derelict Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen to us there. Thanks very much, guys. I've just put in the link to the report. So um, yeah. hopefully everybody in the room can access it now. Um, Chris, back to you. Yeah, no, that's great. So as Ali says, um, Jude and Frank have been doing a research report, which includes a lot of the content from the presentation um, and includes recommendations of, OK, so you know what, what you need to do to, to take this forward, what needs to happen next. Uh, so that's on the link that uh, Ali has shared in the chat there. And we'll share the link again and give that more publicity uh, after the event today as well. So it is completely wonderful that so many of you are still with us. It is really, we're really, really curious to know something about, well, what are you making of all this? What are you taking away from, what are you taking away from all the different things you've heard? So I'd like to share screen again and use the Mentimeter just to get a feel for uh, what some of the people who have been uh, listening and watching all of this uh, have been thinking. Uh, and then we'll bring Rob and Ali and Jude and Frank into a, a, a bit of discussion. Uh, and if Dermot is able to join us from Scotland, we'll bring him in as well. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But just to start with, if we go back to the Mentimeter, that's so that thank you to the 105 people who responded to the uh, previous question. If we move to the next question, we've left this super broad. Uh, just to ask, so you can really say anything you like, what are the main things striking you from the presentations? So just, you know, what to, so somebody's tested the technology and put a full stop, full stop there. Um, as I mentioned before, when we did the Mentimeter, there's nothing, there's no problem if you, if you really like what somebody else has said, then just repeat it and, you know, or, or say your slightly different version or whatever, because, um, yeah, you know, when we go to look at this afterwards and print this out and you know, show it to other people as, you know, we have this webinar and this is what people said when they heard all this stuff. Uh, yeah, if everyone's saying similar things or lots of people are saying similar things, that's very powerful. So I see a number, certainly the word potential is coming up very strongly about the scale of the potential, the, the, the potential to uh, unleash positive energy, to, to bring communities together, to have heavy commun um, healthy communities. The power of the data, the fresh thinking, the enthusiasm, the waste, the massive issue, the climate benefit, the fact that, yeah, we've got working real examples from elsewhere. This isn't just pipe, pipe dream stuff. Community, community into the role of the community in development, community participation, the key careful reuse of protected and important buildings. Yeah, there were some really nice examples and certainly some of the Scottish examples were really good there. Um, where's, so there's a question, where's the difference in our planning? So I'm sure that's the difference between the system in Ireland and the system in the other countries. Um, is it a difference between taking things into account and, mu and must, a should and a must? Um, vision and leadership. So maybe, yeah, carry on putting things into the Mentimeter and, uh, Maybe I'll invite, maybe we'll start with Rob, I'll put you on the spot again, if there's anything that's uh, coming up for you as you've listened to Jude and Frank there and uh, you're seeing what uh, the, the different people in the webinar are saying on the Mentimeter there. Do, do you want to come back in, Rob? Unmute. Un un uh, uh, it's inspiring what, what has been achieved. It's an inspiring to say, perform a non-profit that, that we all have a, resource to tap into um, the things that are striking me is because it does start with leadership but the leadership could actually come from the community we've got to stop waiting on our industries of Dublin to, to give us permission to just get out there and actually start doing it the joy of meanwhile is to just to start um, and involve all aspects of the communities um, the energy makes it happen um, and that in turn entices more and more people involved in getting involved and it becomes a catalyst and we have to be the catalyst that unlock communities because um, towns have been left, left but there's no shortage of potential in them um, and it's I would say it, we must do. Uh, relating to the planning that's tactical I just read that thing about planning. Planning is secondary to leadership primarily this comes down to mindset if you want to do it you'll do it and um, if you don't want to do it, that's also a choice. So um, I think that's the joy of it which is we should be going out to every town and going 
join us in the journey. No, or no, no worries. Um, that's a choice. Um, or get involved and do it. Um, I'll be doing it in the garment. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take them on mantle it pro bono just because I want to leave behind a, b- a better outcome for my my kids. Student Frank, your things. Brilliant. Thank, th- thank you, Rob. And I think th- there's when you talk about the leadership, there's potential for leadership at lots of levels in this. So it's really easy just to say, you know, the government's hopeless. The government need to do something. Um, but you know, we've, we've lots of people on this call from county councils. We've lots of people, you know, like myself who live in you know smaller places or you know t- towns and cities across the country. Um, and you know, so there is leadership that, that can happen at a local level. There are things that people can do at a local level. And if we organise this right, as uh, Jude and Frank were saying, there is the potential for a movement around this. And, and also, we yeah. uh, we know we've got people on the call uh, from the media as well. So you know, the, there is. If, if we play this right, we, we can get a considerable amount of media interest uh, uh, around this. Um, Ali, do you want to just come in and make any comment at this point? Yeah, I mean, I suppose what I truly believe in is that do nothing is not an option. You know, we have to do something. It's kind of our civic duty. Um, so, you know, I feel very strongly from listening to all these presentations. It really gives me hope. You know, like I'm really hopeful and I'm, uh, as Rob says, you know, it's inspiring to listen to these people. You know, if you have passion, you have energy and that's really what it's about is finding that energy and tapping into the energy in our communities and letting them have a voice. And I mean, you know, it's something that I've believed in for many years, you know, uh, community empowerment is, is, is a key part of regeneration. You know, in fact, regeneration it is social empowerment. So, um, yeah, you know, how do we do that in an exciting way in Ireland? You know, that's really the challenge and the opportunity for us now. And I mean, the CTCHC programme, as you know, we've got a, a long waiting list. Um, you know, we want to help these people. So, you know, let us get on with it, really. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Ali. And maybe if I just turn back to Jude and Frank as well, um, I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on the screen and please do, yeah, do carry on keeping things uh, coming up on the screen. Jude and Frank, we've got quite a few people on the call from county councils. I'm wondering if you might have any particular kind of thoughts and advice for them or for people who are involved at a, a local level in some of the existing structures that are there about what they can take from these stories and from the work that you've been involved in. Yeah, yeah we our, our case studies in the report show so, ma- so many different uh, approaches that could be taken. And there's one particularly interesting approach that was taken in Denmark where they use meanwhile use as a almost a public participation of agile master planning. So instead mm-hmm. of trying to have a, a very detailed plan where they had to go and get funding and put all the planning in place, which would take years, they actually got the community involved and let the community take over a space and see what they wanted in the area and use that as, a, as an almost on the ground co-creation agile master planning. So it took, took out a lot of the cost. It, initially may look like it takes longer and it's messy, but it actually takes out a lot of the cost. And when the develop the, the local authorities actually come up with their final plan, master plan for the area, the community are fully behind it. They're out helping for free. They're out volunteering. They're out behind it. They want to see the changes because they've helped create those changes already. They've helped put them in place. So that's definitely a, a massive opportunity we can see for all local te- authorities. And then the community takes ownership of their areas. They take ownership of their towns and they make sure they're well kept. They make sure that they're they're well maintained and they're lively and, and welcoming environments for everybody. So that was a massive, massive opportunity to see how we do our development plans differently. And I suppose what we found, I mean, over the last three years since we've been doing this research around the wider issues, that the communities in Ireland do care. And we've met loads of people with all kinds of backgrounds and there's a load of interest, enthusiasm. People want to get involved, but they have, they, they do feel a bit disengaged. They don't feel that there is clear processes. There's no transparency, you know, and, and, and so it's trying to make it easy for, to take this community-based approach. But I suppose one thing I wanted to say is that the data that Rob showed earlier is so stark. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I was actually emotional looking at the data. And thinking this is this is insane. The evidence is so strong for us to take this approach, you know. And I think we have to do it. Like Ali said, we have no choice. We have to do it. But I think uh, when you have the data, and you and we know from our work, which is very much grassroots based, that people want to be involved. Those together, mm-hmm. it's a very very powerful element to it. And I think uh, it's to get started at a, at a local authority level. You just got to get out there and be brave and do it, you know. 
you might feel that it's not the way things normally happen, but this is about disrupting. This is about doing things differently. And like uh, Rob said in his presentation, we said likewise, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from other countries. And that's what we've been trying to do is bring those lessons to Ireland. So it's not like we're reinventing anything. It's been done before. We just need to be brave and take it on and say, look, let's let's put our communities to the heart of everything we do. The fact that to me, sorry, to on, the, the braveness, the braveness when you actually involve the community anyway. I mean, we did this kind of a Northeast work where it was a massive project, but 95% of the community were involved in the, what's the design going to look like? Um, that's, it's not being brave, it's giving 95% of people what they want anyway. So we can't get, this, can't be appeasing the 5% because the community itself will decide, God, this is what we want to do. And uh, I, I think that's what's inspiring. You are just, just, just listening and having that dialogue and then doing it and just going, you know what, um, for the betterment of our communities, 95% will want to do it and the community will, will railroad in a good way because it's common sense. It, it doesn't make any sense to have all of these opportunities just there in the town. We're swimming downstream. It's it's not swimming upstream. This is easy yeah. when you have communities. It's easy because the economy is growing. It's easy because it's the right thing to do. And it's easy because all of the other countries already done it. And we're tapping into the EU. We're tapping into geniuses and tapping into humans. And, and, and equally, we, we need to make a little bit of fun. What's unique in Ireland is the main thing for me, of course, Towns compete and counties compete against one another. So I'll go, we should actually be playing off how brilliant Kilkenny is doing versus Waterford, Cork, hammering Kerry to go, look, lads, we got the first building done or we got the first use and we did a recycling plant and make, make it fun rather than a chore. Because the reason we live and live, work, play is to actually make our communities better. And, and that's pretty unique. Ireland is pretty unique in a European sense. You don't have that community banter between one another where you go to GAA and all those community forms. We need to capitalize that and go, okay, I'm going to see what Mead can do versus Westmead and go see, see how many vacant stuff we can get going and turn it into the community and use the brilliances that are tidy towns, men's sheds, universities. Yeah. They're brilliant community ventures that, that you go, look, we need some help here. And, and there's no shortage of, of, of goodwill in, in Ireland. It's something that Diaspora and all of us are within and go, give back and you get back. So um, I just think we need to get going. Like uh, I pick 15 towns, give Ali support, get onto the CDs and go, it's going to be happening anyway. Like you can see what Frank and Jude are doing. It's happening anyway. So behind the curve a little bit, grand, crack on. Um, and actually just make it fun. And I'd love a working group that rather than just once off, going every week, it just becomes and it's so fulfilling. Um, it can grab its own energy. Um, I'm pretty confident of that. And, and it, it could grow and grow and grow. And it would be something to be proud of. So I'm, I'm more than happy to give my time to it. And I think as well, you know, this, the, sorry, Chris. No, go on, work away. No, I was gonna say, you know, all the arguments for like not doing, you know, you have to do something like do nothing needs to be costed so that people and communities understand that there is actually a social cost. I mean, uh, you know, we've all said it about the dereliction, people walk past it during lockdown, people were really, you know, struck by it. I think, it, you know, it upset people as, as uh, Frank said. You know, um, but the, the good thing with the opportunity was LinkedIn. I mean, I met so many people. We all met in LinkedIn. So like, you know, lockdown did have a benefit for a lot of people. And as I say, that's how the diaspora network that we've just set up for the CTCHC program got going. And I mean, it is all about, as Rob's saying, we've just got to do this. We've got to get going, you know, and sort of try and get rid of those blockages that we've got because other countries don't have those blockages. So why should we? Great. Thanks very much, Ali. And thanks so much to all the people who have been putting comments into the Mentimeter. It's really nice as we have the conversation to, to you know, have a little look at some of the things that pe people are saying. Um, there's one or two examples that are coming up there on the Mentimeter about positive stories. So I just want to yeah. ask one more question. And this is the only other question we're going to ask on the Mentimeter today. Um, uh, just to try and capture positive examples and stories that you're aware of in Ireland. And they don't necessarily have to be kind of, you know, big master schemes or whatever, but just if, if you can point us or refer us to little bits of this and that and the other where, uh, yeah, you know, we've, we've got the seed of something or the beginning of something in Ireland, that would be really interesting. Um, I, I'm hearing a lot in the conversation around a kind of spirit of, just getting on with it, trying stuff, you know, that we don't have to have the, you know, these amazing big strategic 
plans or whatever, but you know, some of it is uh, about really quite small scale things where we see a bit of vitality and we can just work with that and hopefully do something that creates a bit more vi vitality. Um, so with the first few suggestions coming in uh, in response to the request for positive examples, uh, so Centre for Smart Agent, Aging, Clonic Ilty Kinsale, uh, get a lot of good mentions, uh, Marina Marketing Cork, Culture Court of Viking Triangle in Waterford, Nimble Spaces, uh, Fettered in Tipperary, so obviously it's an opportunity to advertise how wonderful your particular places are, um, car parks and cafes. Yeah, I like that shop, one as well. Rob, yeah, come in. There's a shopping centre in Cork that turned its, its car park into a market. Um, uh, that's another example. So it's, it's, in terms of meanwhile use, I'm in obviously in Dungarvan. And, and Dungarvan is thriving not because of the green waste, because of its community thrives on. It doesn't wait for hand up. It's, it's a DNA thing that we have down here going, stop waiting. And, but they've actually converted all the vacant into where you put art. And, and it was on eco I of going to put all the art into the vacant. Um, retail spaces at the moment, which, which despite being one of the most successful towns in the in the garden, being one of them in, in Ireland, it still has 30% vacancy, which is shocking um, on a European level. But they put art um, into the, the spaces to give the artists a place to, to, to exhibit. I think that was a nice one. Um, the, 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 the Tipperary town one is, is you've not got going yet. And I'm going, Ali. What's stopping you from getting going? Why do we not have a town centre policy? Um, well, we're waiting for the we're waiting for the town centre first policy, which is you know the program we started um, advocating for that in two thousand nineteen. So we were it was, and that was based very much on the data that we were getting back in the towns that we had managed to get the projects set up and and worked through the fifteen step methodology that everybody sticks to. So I mean, it's resources. I mean, you know, as I say, I had no budget in the first year. I just did this because people kept coming to me in the Heritage Council. So, like resources, really, um, and you know that whole love that I have for community participation. I mean, there's lots of people out there. We could all work together, but we do need that policy at a national level. I was at a webinar for Swords on Tuesday night, and it, uh, people were highlighting that we don't have a national policy. You know, so we're like we have a program but we don't have a policy you know so that's kind of um that's a bit unusual yes um tactical early living but i think even coming up in this thing frank dude you must be saying that there are already brilliant examples around the country if we collect them into one group we already have got enormous things to then say these are pockets of brilliance look it's working and get that yeah. sharing across the towns and the communities to go this is amazing what's already been done. Imagine what will happen when you get resource. Uh, and it's a matter of when, not if. We have to get resource. We have to get you resource. No, absolutely. You're right, Rob, there. that There are so many examples being mm. done. I mean, one of the best examples in Ireland of meanwhile use is Temple Bar in terms of its, <laughs> its initial creation was only created through that creative meanwhile use. Otherwise, Temple Bar would have been demolished and turned into something else now it's progression after that is 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 yeah there could be debates over that and it's yeah unfortunately mm. there's some issues around it's it's further development but those learnings of what how current projects are working how current meanwhile use is happening the lessons learned what 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 her, uh, hurdles do they have to overcome and if we can share that learning and information, it will make it easier for new groups to come in and new towns and new communities mm. to repeat the same without mm. having to go through the same mm. barriers, the same blockers or the same challenges every time is that we can, if we can share that knowledge that will save and make it much easier for other people to do it. But there's definitely some great examples in, around. Definitely, yeah. There's, there's the one in Cork, Princess Street, that obviously everybody's looking at it going to pedestrianise the whole thing. That's a, that is a mean value. For the, it's not perfect, but in fact, trade went up 30% on it year on year. That's 30% that's, that's growth in trade in a town. Traders would be biting your hand off to go to twice the impact of COVID. But I love the way the parklets have been done in other towns. They're going, just get out, take the car park away. I see it in the garden, I see it in other... It's, 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 it's all the traders are going... My sales are up 30%. That's three years worth of growth in the summer. But those are the good things that need to get out there, right? Like, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that yeah, if it's if it's taking a strategic approach to it, it could definitely, if you make, turn town centres back into destinations, then it's a win-win-win for everybody. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Jude. Can I just interrupt a little bit? Some, somebody just text put on the chat uh, about how to 
participate in the Mentimeter. So if I can just say that bit, and also Dermot's joined us, so we'll, we'll bring him into the conversation as well. Um, so for the Mentimeter, we're, we're just on this question, you hopefully can see on your screen about positive examples and stories. Uh, if you go to www.menti.com, and you can either do that on a, you know, open another tab on your computer or do it on a smartphone, and you'll be asked for a, um, an event code or, or a meeting code, uh, and that's 27745443. It's kind of on the top of the screen, hopefully, but I know depending on what device you're using, it may not be too big. So it's menti.com 27745443. So yes, Dermot Lawler has uh, joined us from Scotland, I think. And uh, because Dermot, your uh, video presentation was brilliant. We're so grateful. It, it set the scene really well. Um, you've been in the room with us for the last few minutes. You, you might at least get a sense of the energy mm -hmm. um, that uh, has been uh, kind of, yeah, that's come from the combination of presentations we've had. So I'm just curious, Dermot, I don't know whether you catch anything from the screen or the last little bits you've heard about just where, where your energy is right now and you know, what's the really exciting edge of, of these kind of things right now. You know, thanks very much, Chris, and thanks everyone. I, I, it's fantastic. I mean, I was just looking at the Mentimeter kind of coming up, and it, and it, it's uh, it's just a, a fantastic visual expression of energy, insights, passion. So that's that's phenomenal. So I, I came in uh, just in in the back of of the last chat there, and maybe just to offer in three things, um, and and they are collect, consolidate, confirm. So if we're going to influence stuff, change policy and whatnot. Part of that is already happening. So to Rob's point, um, if we collect the examples, but also collect it in a way that becomes a product. So a good example of that is the compendium for the civic economy, which was an agenda uh, that was about trying to support localism. It collected examples from all over Europe and then created it as a book. And then the book was a product that could influence others. So the first one is to collect. Mm -hmm. The second one then is to consolidate so on the basis of European, but also Irish examples and Irish uh, places and Irish processes, we could then construct a theory of change. So here's a bunch of projects happening across the country. When we look at the projects together, we can construct a theory of change for here, us and now. And we can also then chart out uh, a route map and the appropriate mechanisms to deliver on that theory of change. So it doesn't just become a splattering of things here, there and yon, it becomes an agenda for influence. And the third bit then is with that, then you can direct policy partnerships and pathfinders. So I suppose it's to kind of capitalize on the energy that, that, that you've kicked off and maybe just a suggestion then around connect, consolidate, confirm. Brilliant, thank you Dermot. And uh, I'm sure we'll be back to you before we finish at uh, four o'clock. Um, I'm keen to move the conversation forward or to keep moving the conversation forward and really I'm interested in you know where we go from here how do we build the next stages um, I wrote in my notes igniting a movement and a campaign um, but you know obviously we've got loads of energy loads of good things going on um, Jude and Frank I don't know if you want to say maybe one or two words about what you were uh, I, I think I'll stop sharing at this stage but stops the screen sharing yeah, if, if you want to say one or two words uh, about what you were recommending as the next steps uh, and then I'll, I'll open up the uh, the zoom chat as well so that if anybody wants to particularly make offers or uh, you know particularly say there's you know so, something that's really important to happen now in terms of make, making this movement work and energizing it um, so yeah Jude and Frank what, what, what are you recommending in terms of next steps yeah, so I suppose um, there's been a few things in, in the report. We go into a bit more detail of what the recommendations are and likewise next steps as well. But uh, one of the things that we feel is quite important at this stage is definitely bringing the case studies together, which is already clear from the from the from today. There is a lot of really nice examples and we came across quite a few as well, but also some kind of detailed policy briefings, which really should be uh, prepared for, for the key departments, Department of Taoiseach, Finance, Environment, you know, so to read, so to understand that the, and the local authorities uh, really understand what this is about and, and really, I suppose, give the data behind it too, what that potential actually is. Um, and around that then, over time, 
what would be really good is to have some kind of um, feasibility study, obviously, which would be ideal. Because obviously, I suppose, just from our perspective, that intermediary type approach is important so that we have the right systems in place, that it's a transparent process, and that everyone can understand how they can get involved. And we'd like to see that right across Ireland. And I suppose that's one of the things that we've kind of realised from speaking to different uh, people, different backgrounds who are looking for spaces that they don't really know how to engage. Mm -hmm. So really there's the policy briefings and there's, there's also the transparent process. Yeah, so if we have, if, if in every town there was communities who are trying to work with owners, who are trying to work with local authorities, if they're all repeating the same process in every town over and over and over again, there's a massive waste and a mass waste of people's time and resources. But there'll be a, lo a lot of, um, I suppose, it, it will drain people unnecessarily yeah. when their energy should be going into making the places better. So that's why we'd like to see in the best practice across Europe is to have some sort of intermediary organizations it could be one organization but it could be multiple organizations and we've seen and we've seen in cork city alone which we know very well obviously because our study's been three years now is there's a lot of spaces in cork city alone which are would have been ideal for the last couple of years mm. for, for communities and would still be ideal for communities and it's how we unlock those and if we start yeah if we start with the publicly owned buildings and unlocking those for communities first because then we can overcome the the challenges on on dealing with with owners who don't necessarily want to engage if we start with the public mm. owned buildings first and working with the communities to find effective uses for those overcome the challenges of planning fire regulations health and safety insurance public liabilities they're all challenges but they're challenges that we can overcome absolutely and if we learn the lessons of how to overcome those questions those challenges we can spread that information to everyone so everyone can also and, do the same and i suppose it's about going away from this idea that it's just a short-term pop-up for a few weeks that actually what we are interested in is something that's a long-term thing you know talk about three to five years and then you can really start to see the change so if we're going to do a feasibility study and it's something across ireland then obviously pilot in different regions and you could try out different models and you, if you take that time span it may seem like a long time three to five years but towns have been around for 200 250 300 years 400 years so over the lifespan and that's where they've already been existing towns and hopefully they'll go on for a thousand years so if we take that full lifespan, five years mm. of experimentation is really nothing out of the whole yeah. lifespan of the town. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, just, I mean, a couple of things there that feel to me really, really important. One, when you're talking about the intermediary body, I think that's absolutely critical for helping us to get across the kind of silo problems that we have, you know, that you deal with the Department of Housing or the Department of this or the agency for that or whatever, and you're never quite really dealing with the complexity and all the interconnections that we've been describing all afternoon and, and the, the intermediary bodies create the potential that you can cut across that. So that, that I, I, I really completely go f agree with that and recognize that. Um, and just as a, another little shout out in the equation somewhere, um, I hear some very, very similar language coming out of the new European Bauhaus initiative. So, mm -hmm. and, and there is, does seem to be a real life and energy around that as well. So, you know, that may be another way to kind of cut across the, de the, the departments at the national level um, and actually say, look, you know, that we can bring, we can bring some money in to, to help do some of this stuff. And uh, particularly, you know, the, the business there about what they're bringing beauty into the agenda, that beauty is actually, or aesthetics, uh, you know, part of the quality of life and you know, part of what makes us feel good about the places we live and work and play in and, and, and so on is, is all feels very, very healthy. Rob, would you like to come in with some words about what needs to happen next to keep us moving forward? I think firstly, um, just getting the data by county and council, but getting out there, like I presented the table of going, this is the council, this is the opportunity, uh, this is the number of people. That has to be there all the time going, what's the purpose? Putting young people back into homes, bringing back the vacant number of targets we could actually do. I think helping the vacancy officers and the local authorities, so well, they're the toolkit, but having a collective, like it's like a rhythm going, bring them together. How do we now help you step up? I do think somebody in the T-shirt office, and it is T-shirt because this is goes across departments. It's so department of, it can't be housing, it can't be heritage, it can't be social services. By the way, you haven't even talked about the childcare aspect. The childcare is, is, is a social policy to that. Climate change, great, but it has to be T-shirt. And I think the CSO, or um, Central Statistics Office and the Strategic Development Goals play a massive role. We're going, 
let's, let's go and get some measures out. And just let's get some measures out. It doesn't have to be right. Why? Because then we can say, actually, these are doing really well at the moment. How do we learn from them? And like having a, having a table would, would see the benefits. People have to see the benefits. We're, we're, we're talking three million people touched, lives touched on to make this better. So um, I, I think that's it, which is going, one, you have to get resource alley, fine. But two, having this more regular, um, and then admit by publishing the data or the dashboard and putting it up on a website, I'm shit at websites. Um, so I'm happy to give the data to whoever, that's the point. And then third, we have to get, get the T-shirts off, let's go, right, let's, let's get this rolling. Let's get the 15 towns going. Um, the last bit is interesting. We've never covered what I would call modular. And I'm, the reason I'm saying that is called we've got existing buildings, but in lots of the stuff in the Bauhaus, what we're seeing in the country, other countries is modular stuff coming in and plonking um, solutions for housing, so for homeless. But for me, there's, ma there's, there's that modular, but the fifth is right now we've got so many vacant homes that are in fair deal. We could have used that alone to solve the housing crisis um, of there's, I think there's something like 23,000 homes in fair deal that have got nobody in them. And yes, we've got homeless and we've got student accommodation. It seems to me that that's a, an immediate win for somebody to pick and drive. It's just a marketing solution. So I'm obviously just stupid looking at that going, wait, how, how, how have we got that space? Um, and why have we not connected the needs of, of students and homes to that right now? Um, but I really think I really think it's that that it's resource um, in a good way and metrics will will by CSO and SDGs. So I'm 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 here to help Ali and I'm here to help guys. So whatever way you need, be blamed um, for putting data out there and go look. You know, somebody somebody's got to put it out there. Um, use use me. I've got the agenda. Yes, that's wonderful, Rob. And I, I, I saw in the Mentimeter piece somebody mentioned, I think, I think it was Fingal, um, about uh, an intellectual disability project as a way in, as a, as a way for starting. So, and I, one of my particular interests will be about the potential for schools, you know, to, to actually start adopting these projects and, you know, to you know, give, give a school a bit of freedom to actually say what, you know, what could happen in our town centre with the vacant spaces and properties and how could that be and how could life be different and that, that's a real way to catalyze and engage yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to get there of transition years right we've got these hundreds of thousands 25,000 transition years yeah they could become our resource on the ground with tidy towns to go and say what could we use we need to give a voice to kids and go and they're going to be affected moving into the, the that so Tie in transition years as the resource up to the university and then into tidy town seems to me three generations across. They're technical capable, way more capable than certainly me. Um, so how do we tap into transition years and then into mm -hmm. university and then tidy town stroke elderly um, men shed, no offense to the 65 plus, but surely yeah. that we can tap into them. I'd love to know, is that being done anywhere else? No. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. We're moving into our kind of closing time, so we will formally finish at four o'clock. Uh, I'm going to give Dermot the chance to come back in and give us some more drops of wisdom if he would like to, and then we'll go back to Jude and Frank just in case they've got anything else they want to pick up on, and then we'll go to Ali for kind of closing words because because it's her show. So uh, Dermot first. Yeah, so I suppose just to pick up on Rob's point on the transition, I think that's an excellent point, and. Um, uh, so there's two levels to that. I, I think one is around co deliberately constructing opportunity pathways for young people. So not every kid is going to do the inter and love it. Not every kid is going to do the leave insert and love it. I know it's called something different, but some kids don't, they leave, they mm. stop and things happen, but they've got capabilities. So by tapping into that, we can create opportunity pathways, which might mean different apprentice routes or vocational routes or partnership routes so that we, we could deliberately construct a different learning pathway. Why does that matter? Because the evidence suggests that if you give young people in places a chance, they build high levels of affinity and trust to the place. So you've got retention. So I, I think that there's a really powerful idea in what Rob's uh, framing there. Second bit is on the fair deal. Uh, 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 as someone who's, whose mom lives in Ireland, uh, like a lot of places, the whole care system is highly fragmented. Your choice are live at home or go to a care home. 
and it's the it's the it's the choices in between we need to construct. So it's interesting that the fair deal is a portfolio of spaces which have occurred within a care context, which could be repurposed into care villages, well-being communities, step-down care, intermediate care, uh, a whole raft of different things. We could actually deliver Slauncher Care and its intent now. The third bit, I suppose, is that to build on the, the capability, so the pathway bit, uh, a new way of looking at care using what we already have. But the, 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 one of the things that Ireland, I think, has been phenomenally successful on is making the impossible possible. Uh, and, and things like the programme for prosperity and renewal, the discussions with the unions, uh, the kind of negotiations that went through, this idea of a programme and a compact around certain outcomes was really interesting. So I think that one of the things that, the, to, to echo the, the points from, from Frank and, and Rob, is to think about a programme, a programme approach with outcomes, and that, that allows you to do some of the heavy lifting so that the communities then can fit out some of the things. So a programme approach with national impacts, uh, looking at how that programme approach could deliver a transformation agenda on care and a transformation agenda on young people using what we have, I think would be a phenomenal and achievable uh, approach for Ireland. Brilliant, thank you very much, Dermot. And uh, yeah, there's some wonderful things going on, which you just reminded me as well at the moment around moonshot missions um and out there as well but if anybody wants to google that um jude and frank any you've started something anything you'd like to say before we finish for today i suppose really um a lot of this comes from looking around where you live and i suppose you know i suppose what we do is encourage people to begin to look around more where they live to look look up look at the buildings look at the streets look at the environment because this is one aspect of a lot of things that need to be tackled. And I suppose from our perspective, we're glad to have the opportunity to put this out there as being something that can unlock a lot of potential uh, for us, I suppose. And we're now moving on to the next thing because we feel there is a requirement to really come at this in so many different ways. So we'd encourage people to take a fresh look at wherever they live and really start to find out where those opportunities are. Brilliant. Jude? Uh, no, I'll, I'll, you don't have to. last word. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Listen, thank you very, very much for everything. And thanks, Rebecca, in the chat there, uh, putting some stuff around. Amazing work openly mapping vacant sites. So citizen science is one of the things we didn't quite get to that mm. could have been in the conversation today as well. Absolutely. Um, Ali, you're the boss. Last words, last few minutes for well, you. It's a collaboration, sorry. My, my partner, Dennis, just teases me mercilessly because he says, I, you know, the amount of times I use that word a day. Um, anyway, okay, so yeah, well, basically, I just fundamentally want to thank the people who um, worked with me at the very start when I went around the country with trying to sort of, uh, you know, sow the seed of an idea of doing a collaborative town centre health check um, and went around the universities and the ITs and they all pitched in and everybody said, if it's for the good of the country, we'll do it for free. So I, I cannot forget those people who were with me that first year when I didn't have any funding whatsoever. Um, and then the Heritage Council board got behind it, which is fantastic. So I'd like to thank them as well. You know, so, I mean, yeah, the future is bright if we all just work together. And, you know, I do believe in collaboration. So we have a lot of information, a lot of reports, a lot of um, output, um, you know, for better outcomes coming out in the next few weeks to do with the CTCHC programme. We also have a, a meeting on the 24th of November, so that'll be our reeling in the year. Um, and that's when the community in the programme will get together to sort of talk about the year and how it went and what we want to do next year. Um, and we'll finish off, that's the 24th of November, so it's just before Christmas or the run up to Christmas, so we'll be doing Christmas cocktails. Sorry to mention the word, <laughs> the C word. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is very positive. I, I just, I love meeting new people because it does give you hope. And I think as well, the Diaspora Network, you know, that meeting that we had, that first meeting last Friday, there's a lot of people outside of Ireland who are looking into Ireland and looking back and really wanting to help the communities and the, and the potential leaders. And also one thing I think really we need to look at as well is young people and how do we bring on young people as leaders and um, civic leaders for the future. We do a lot of work with the universities. The students are amazing. Again, we would not have this programme without those students and those young people. So to me, that's the future. Uh, so thank you to them. Brilliant. Thank you, Ali. And a few people make comments around the um, potential inputs from children and young people, not just transition years, um, which is really, really good. So we are close to four o'clock. It is amazing and brilliant that over 100 people have stayed with us for the whole of the afternoon. 
really quite incredible. We will share the slides and the, the output from the Mentimeter and you know, the various links of uh, what's going on and how people can get involved and what can happen next and the report and so on and so forth. So there's, there's plenty of uh, sharing to, to be going on. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's make the revolution happen. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank That's, you very uh, much. Thanks, 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 David. Thank you. Thanks.